Hi, I'm Bernard Leung and you may know me as an executive who understands that healthcare is seriously a very expensive business but in my spare time I want to learn more about leadership and how to expand a digital healthcare business in Asia Pacific. You're listening to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business technology and media in Asia and today I have Grace Park, co-founder and president of Dog Dog. Welcome Grace and it's great to have you on the podcast and most importantly I did mention two months ago when I got co on the show, you'll probably have to come on because I know mm-hmm. you for a long time and we will be really bad if I didn't get you on. <laughs> well, thank you, Bernie. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. So I think it's interesting because in the earlier conversation, I talk about co, he talks about a company, he talks about a founding of a company, he talks about the business of a company. Right. I think there's something a lot more interesting to talk about you because you have a really interesting background. And one of the things I enjoyed a lot talking to you over the years, and we got to know each other since I think 2004 right. on that, is your perception of thinking about leadership because you have a great military career before that and Harvard Business School and all that. So I want you to tell my audience more about your background. How did you start your career? Sure, happy to share that. So I started my career as a Army officer after graduating from West Point, the United States Military Academy. I actually first went off to earn my airborne and air assault badges. These are from jumping out of airplanes and parachuting and also rappelling out of helicopters because to me those were important badges to earn my way before becoming a platoon leader. Uh, But before becoming a platoon leader, I had the opportunity of walking on to the national judo team in preparation for the Olympics there. Unfortunately, my aspirations were cut short from an injury, and so thereon I went over to the 10th Mountain Division. That's a rapid deployment force under the 18th Airborne Corps and became a platoon leader. So at 22 years of age, led a platoon of 44 mostly male soldiers. I was the first female to have that role. And then after completing that experience, I volunteered to go to Korea. Being Korean in background, I felt it an important part of my experience to be able to experience what is the history of Korea, especially since my parents lived through the Korean War, what the current capabilities were, and what the future may hold there. Then came back to the United States and completed my final fifth year at the Pentagon as a captain, looking at how we can re-engineer Army intelligence to the 21st century. Scenarios like 9-11, this was back in 1999, were imagined and planned and prepared for. And so that was how I completed my five years of military service. And after doing that, I uh, embarked on fresh challenges in the private space and went into healthcare because it was a sector for me in which I could wake up and do something with meaning and purpose. And to me, being able to enhance and extend human life was that meaningful purpose. Continuing on that purpose I had while serving in the military. And in between there, I also went off to grad school, earned my master's degree at Harvard Business School, and also went to the Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, a dual master's degree, and then landed in Singapore about 15 years ago on a Fulbright Fellowship. That's right. You were studying something interesting with the Fulbright Fellowship, right? Yes, actually studying innovation, studying entrepreneurship here in Singapore. I had so many amazing classmates at Harvard from Singapore, and they just said to me, Grace, Singapore is in the midst of transformation. And that's what piqued my interest to come here for the first time to Southeast Asia Mm. and see it firsthand. I'm pretty happy because both Ko and you moved from the U.S. to Singapore, and I know that at least I have some really smart people that I can talk to every other one. So, <laughs> I want to zoom in a little bit. I think before Dog Dog, you yes. have actually taken senior executive roles with uh, Bristol Myers with uh, BMS, <laughs> there's known, and Medtronic. Right. And I think it would be very interesting because these are very big healthcare companies and right. you were taking a very, very regional role on that. Can you talk about what you have done in these companies and how that experience shaped the way in how you operate in the Asia-Pacific market? Sure, okay. Well, I had a total of 10 years in corporate healthcare and Bristol-Myers Squibb, I actually started out in the US a couple of years in sales and marketing. And before coming out to Asia, I had this amazing opportunity to be a part of 
the Secure the Future program. This is for women and children with HIV AIDS. And we had $115 million in providing grant money to mostly mothers in giving them a second chance at life, providing them money so then they can be entrepreneurs themselves and have a sustainable future for their own family as well as their village. So I had that opportunity in nine African countries and then uh, came out to Asia here launching Barracud, which is a drug for hepatitis B. And we know the prevalence rate is very high in this part of the world. And so being a part of that organization and launching a drug in 13 countries throughout Asia was an extraordinary experience just to go deep into each and every country. I think oftentimes as foreigners, we think of Asia as just a, a regional block, but being able to see or work in regional headquarters and seeing the nuances and differences in cultures and peoples in each of these 13 countries was quite fascinating. And then moving on to Medtronic, I led operations and had full PL responsibility and left there as a managing director for Southeast Asia. And that's pretty interesting because you have operated in such a market and when it comes to dot dot, you also apply that experience into sure. expanding into the region. Before we get to that conversation, I want to ask you then, in your career journey, what are the most interesting life lessons you can share with my audience? Oh, that's a very good question, Bernie. I would say that, first of all, is that if you look back at my career, I think it is okay if you don't necessarily fit in, but keep pursuing it if you truly believe that you belong there. And I saw that when I was at West Point, being an Asian American female, I did not look the part, but I believed in the mission to be a leader of character. Same thing all throughout, you know, even now as an entrepreneur, coming out of being a corporate professional for 10 years and boom, being an entrepreneur, I may not have fit in right away, but I truly believed in what we're doing and, and the problem that we're solving at Doc Doc. So that's the first thing I would say, is that even if you don't fit in, if you believe you belong there and you're doing something of great purpose, then keep going at it. And the second thing I would say is that if you do fall in love with a mission that's far greater than yourself, then that will sustain you through the long haul. You know, I think oftentimes if the mission is not something that's more self-serving and not something that's much greater, it's really hard because life is not about sunshine and rainbows all the time, right? And being able to sustain through those darker days, it's based on what you're doing on the day-to-day, -day, the purpose that you have. I'm going to get back to that conversation about leadership later, but I'm going to first talk about Doc Doc. And I think part of the reason why I really wanted to have you on this conversation is that I have very few leaders that I've known, like yourself, that actually have done expanding business across the Asia Pacific. And you think about, in your case, it's digital healthcare. And I've heard the founding story of Dr. from Cole's perspective. Okay. And he definitely had articulated in, in, a, in the way that he feels most comfortable with. But I'm much more curious to hear the story of Dr. Uh -huh. from your perspective. Can you articulate the founding story from your perspective and how did that translate to the founding of the company and where you currently are? are today? Sure. The founding of what Doc Talk is today, uh, the purpose behind the company, actually stems from a deeply personal experience. It's uh, when our daughter was born healthy, but at her third month checkup, about 100 days, the pediatrician said something's not right. She's jaundiced. And so we brought her into, Cole had brought her into the hospital just to get a simple blood test done. And we thought it would be a just a routine check, just to ensure we rule out anything major. But one blood test turned into a multiple, a series of other tests, and soon being ushered into a room full of surgeons where the head surgeon had said, your daughter has a rare liver condition called biliary atresia. We have to admit her to the hospital right now, do a procedure tomorrow, and um, just said it in a very matter-of-fact kind of way. You were traveling at that point, and then you were dealing with the news, right? Cole had been traveling at the time. He had just come back from a red-eye flight from London. And so that's why he had said, I'm awake, I'll, let me just go ahead and do yeah. this. Because we didn't think anything major of it. It's mm. just a routine test. She was born healthy, mm. right? Mm. And so I think um, for any new parent or mother, it's uh, you want to ensure that your child is healthy and there's no health issues. Mm. But when that 
called had called me in and said, there's something not right here. You know, let's let's go through this together. And when the the doctor was explaining what we needed to do, basically hand over our daughter, we knew our world had changed at that moment. And the doctor didn't know who I was in terms of having 10 years of healthcare experience or being able to talk to doctors or lead teams who talk to doctors on a day-to-day basis. And uh, when our questions weren't answered, for example, you know, doctor, how many times have you done a liver transplant? Because it sounds pretty serious. And also, you know, how much is this gonna cost? Or how are your other patients doing? Are they thriving? When the answers weren't forthright, it became clear to us that this was not the right team for us. And so coincidentally, another doctor at that very same hospital, he was just doing a heart surgery on a child, came into our room, to, I called, I, I, I messaged him and he came to us to be our patient advocate. And he actually, a few years prior, we did a medical mission together for children who needed heart surgeries in Vietnam, and uh, we were able to pay for that, those procedures. And so he was on our side as a patient advocate. He was like family to us. And uh, he took us out of that room and helped us in the international search for finding the right liver doctor for our daughter. And that's what we did we searched internationally and we found the right doctor. He was actually one of the doctors who was one of the pioneers of live liver transplants. We later found out he's actually 60% less in cost, which wasn't so obvious at the time. Because I think oftentimes we assume or associate expertise with high price. And that's really not the case when you have information asymmetry in the healthcare space. Mm. And that information asymmetry led you to found Doc Doc in the process? That's right. Because when Cole, who donated his liver, was recovering in the ICU, mm. we realized what we just went through is something in which the everyday patient needs to have this kind of information. Can we put together a platform such that we can provide greater transparency, ultimately empower patients, mm allowing them to make data-informed decisions. And that is what DocDoc is today. So, from your perspective, what is the company's vision and mission then? So if you think about what we do, just to summarize, what we've done is build out a knowledge model. And this is really what has taken a lot of work and collected hundreds of data points on a per-doctor basis. We've built out our AI platform called HOPE and through the algorithms them to be able to match patient to doctors on a procedure and condition level of detail. And we also marry that up with our contact center of doctors to be able to not just have technology, but the human touch, helping the patients throughout the entire discovery process. And the goal is to help empower patients throughout that entire doctor discovery process. If you think about what is status quo today, what is the problem we're solving? Patients actually find or choose their doctors based on hearsay, on anecdotes. They believe it's impossible to actually make data-informed decisions. One, they have to ask friends and family, but that's typically from a sample set of one or just a handful. Two is they may refer to directories insurance directories, but how do you distinguish doctor number five on that list versus doctor 75, just based off an address and a photo, right? Or they may ask their family doctor. But then again, family doctors also have formal or informal networks of who they refer to, largely based on their medical school, you know, friendships that they've developed. And so it does not allow for patients to be in the center. That is what status quo is today, is that patients believe it's impossible to make data-informed decisions, and they refer to these other sources because they believe that's the best they can do. Mm. What we're solving and what the vision of DocDoc Doc is to provide greater transparency to empower patients so then, yes, they can actually choose a doctor based on information that is relevant in choosing their right doctor, based on the detail of procedures and conditions. And I guess with the doctor's expertise, it is also important because it's global, because there might be certain types of disease or illness or operate, surgery operations that require maybe someone that operates a lot in another country that has that kind of condition, and 
you can't really reach them unless you have the information. True, right? I mean, for us, we went to Japan. Our doctors were not in the country we were in, right? And so doc, doc, we have 23,000 doctors and we operate in eight countries. So there's a request and a demand recommendations to come to many more countries. But um, And the beauty of this product that we've built is that it's based off of international code sets. So it's universal, but we have to build it systematically. So given the start of the company till now, what is your current role and coverage as the co-founder and president of Delta? I have three main roles. One is for public relations, being the face of the company. <laughs> That's very honest. <laughs> yeah. Along with Cole. And number two is other co-founder duties, meeting up with investors, shareholders, business partners, working out the strategy, working out the operational strategic plan with the executive team. And the third part is operational nature, and that's leading the provider sales team. This is the team that interacts face-to-face with the doctors. And given you have that Asia-Pacific operations experience, that becomes pretty useful in this role, right? Yes, and I think one of the things that we've learned is that we put in people with the expertise, the strengths in the key roles, Mm -hmm. and that's my area. I have not asked Cole this question sure. because I know you're more in tune to this at the start of the company and build it to its presidency. What keeps you awake at night or gets you excited every morning about Dogman's mission? Well, my daughter keeps me awake at night because she literally wakes me up. But uh, <laughs> in terms of you know what gets me excited is truly changing the lives of people, so bringing you- light there because there is the information asymmetry. There is that lack of information where people believe it's impossible to make data-informed decisions. If you give that information to the patient and they make the decisions, how much more powerful that can be in terms of outcomes, in terms of cost savings, and in terms of reducing anxiety throughout that entire process. So am I right to say that if dot dot were to be successful, it means that wherever you live, you will be able to get access to proper and well-informed medical expertise at the right price anywhere? We're not global yet. Yes. We're in the, in the markets that we are. And uh, we, you know, if we are everything to everybody, we haven't built it out yeah. in a constructive, strategic yeah. way because we are building our company in an iterative, uh, learning and adapting kind of a way. Yeah. But the core technology the foundation to it is built out and is there. But it is something in which patients anywhere in the world would be able to benefit and experience and consume healthcare in a radically different way. So given that DotDoc's focus is to be the leader in patient intelligence, how do you build the trust and also bringing doctors in DotDoc's network? I think this is something that I didn't talk to Cole about. Sure. I think you have a much more intuitive view because you directly engage doctors both right. in your previous careers and even now, yep. which is much more important than before, right? Mm-hmm. How do you build that trust and bring them into your network? I think that's a very good uh, point to cover, Bernie, because you need trust in any partnership in any industry, but it's of paramount importance in healthcare because we deal with the health, the lives of patients. And so, you know, dealing with privacy, dealing with confidential information, healthcare is is really important. So, you know, for how to uh, work with patients or partner with them, build that trust, I think it's a few things. One is what exactly is the value proposition? What are we bringing to the table? How are we improving, changing the lives of doctors? And I think that there are three main pain points that the doctors have in how we are addressing it through our value proposition. Firstly, it's a doctor who was specifically trained to treat certain conditions or to do certain procedures. We are bringing patients to those doctors. Those patients who need those treatments are being introduced to those doctors, right? And the patients choose. Because if a doctor actually spends an extra year doing a subspecialty training, for instance, a pediatric gastroenterologist is specifically trained to do procedures in that special subspecialty area. We help match up the patients who need to see that subspecialist to the doctor who's been particularly trained for that and is good at it, providing high quality service and outcomes. That's number one. Secondly, at the end of the day, is going back to the trust. It's doctors 
care about privacy, security, following regulations, because it's a highly regulated sector. And that's also what we provide. All the information that we do collect on a per doctor basis is saved and secured in a private closed loop database system. So it's not something in which we open up to the public at large. This is something in which we're using the information to run the algorithms and do the matching properly. And so ensuring that security is critical. And the third point is, on the most part, doctors, when they work in the private sector, they are business owners, right? In order to leave the clinic doors open, they need to run it as a business. And so for us, we have no conflict of interest, no financial ties with the doctor. We do this because we don't charge the doctors. We do this because we are bringing the right, most suitable patients to the doctors. And I think one interesting nuance probably to some of my audience in US is that I think in places like Singapore, I, I don't know which other parts of Asia, and you definitely know this better than I do, uh, doctors are not allowed to advertise. Right. There are very strict advertising guidelines. Right. In every country, there are slight nuances, but that is a very clear, any breaches to advertising can be a fine, you know, jail terms, uh, loss of license. There are pretty strict penalties based on violating any advertising guidelines. And I think that those kind of nuances can only be known if someone like you have operated and know the context of right. that part yeah. of the world. That's why the security... That's why trust is very yeah. important with the doctor because we are an extension of that doctor, of the doctor's clinic, to heed those regulatory requirements. Mm. So you have led in expanding Donald's business across Asia Pacific, I think across eight countries. Can you talk about how you think strategically on the go-to market and maybe building the right teams to expand in your countries such as Korea and Hong Kong? Okay, so we're actually in eight countries and expanding in these countries. So I would actually say that there are a few key points in terms of the go-to-market strategy. I think it, number one, is identifying where the centers of excellence are. Because in certain countries or certain institutions, this is where the top surgeons treating certain conditions all come together. And they've built that specifically and is identified as such. Secondly, it's about, you know, where are the needs based on our client partnerships. So we work with corporate clients and insurances, and they have a specific need on which countries that they would like us to have presence in. And so that guides us in terms of where to go. And thirdly, I would say is where are the patients going, right? And so that's really where we focus in on in terms of the markets that we are in. So for example, like in Singapore, it's a medical tourism market, for example, right. um, in the region. So people come to Singapore, but you also need to pinpoint to the right expertise to the center of excellence. Exactly. I'm very curious, you have worked in a corporate environment. What are the lessons that you learned working in a startup environment with Dog Dog? And if you were to do Dog Dog again, I mean, wherever we are all involved in startups, we will make some mistakes from the very start, right? Sure. What would you have done differently? I think one of the key lessons that I've learned is the pitfalls of middle management. You know, I kind of alluded to it before. It's very important to have expertise in critical roles because they're the ones who are able to provide the structure, the strategy. And I think in terms of having then hungry, aggressive workers underneath that are going to be able to execute is critical in order to, I think that dynamic or that setup in a startup, I've learned actually works very well. In the beginning days, uh, I followed more the model of a corporate in which oftentimes we have the ideal structure of a team uh, where you have hierarchy and different levels to ensure ideal information flow. But that's in a corporate organization. In startups, we don't have that as much, but adopting the ideals from a corporate doesn't necessarily mean that it works well in startup environment as well. So is that all? Are there any other interesting stories you can share? I think in a, at the end of the day, a company is not more than its people. 
right? That's what a company is. And so that's why I focus in on, I think if I go back to, I, I have so many, actually I could write a book about this. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that... I, I'll, be, I'll be one of the first few people to queue up for it. All right, <laughs> I, I, I could go through it. There, there could be a hundred chapters on every single mistake. I, any problem that you could name, I probably actually made that mistake. But I think that quite a few of it actually goes back to the kind of person we have in critical roles. It goes back to the person. Since I have you here, uh -huh. and we just talked a little bit, and this is actually what I'm just taking a segue into one of the other main subjects of the day, which is about the question of leadership. Okay. We have these private conversations on leadership many times, recommended me very good books on leadership, and I think you have some pretty uh, thoughtful and insightful views on leadership itself. Okay. So, yeah. the first question I'm probably going to ask is, what are the books in leadership which have inspired and further your thinking on the subject itself? Okay, I'm not sure if I've already shared these books with you in the past, but um, I would say number one is Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. He's a Holocaust survivor, and he wrote that it's important to find purpose in life and have hope in the outcome. And I think that that's quite meaningful to what I'm doing here today in terms of doing work that is purposeful, purpose-driven, and having hope for the outcome, the changing and transformation of how patients consume healthcare. So that's number one. Number two is uh, one of my former professors at Harvard, Warren Bennis, wrote many books on leadership. I think just to name one of them is On Becoming a Leader. He articulates a concept called the crucible experience. And it's when somebody goes through a hardship a person actually will emerge stronger for it or actually wither away. And through these crucible experiences, it's the hardships of it. And it's not to walk away from it for me, but to actually embrace it and come out stronger from all of this. And the third book I would recommend is actually another professor of mine from the Kennedy School, Ron Heifetz's book on leadership without easy answers. He talks about adaptive leadership and pacing. So it's not the top-down authoritarian style, but truly the, the style or the method of being able to bring out the best in others and how you motivate and influence others. And to me, I think these are classics. You know, if I had to add any other books, it'd probably be Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People or Cialdini's on Persuasion. For many of the books that I'm reading now, I think they tap onto many of these foundational classical books and they adapt it to new scenarios, perhaps like parenting. But I always hearken back, I always go back to, to me, the classics. This is interesting. You're the second person with a military career okay. who actually recommended Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Oh, wow. The other person who I interviewed was an entrepreneur. He actually was in the Special Forces. Right, okay. So you have also been in the military career as a military officer, so it's interesting. <laughs> This is where I actually waited to hold the question Okay. now. You have an interesting career before HBS in the US military, and you were based in Korea, and it's right. not an easy tour of duty because you were in the demilitarized zone area, and it's dangerous, right? At the point in 1999, we are talking about those days. I think even it's still dangerous today. Right. So how did that experience shape you as a leader from the military, and how did it bring forward into the corporate world? when you come out you know, having a military background, how do you see the world with that lens? Sure. So I was actually stationed with the 501st Military Intelligence Brigade at Yongsan Base. And that experience was extraordinary. And as I already mentioned, I'm Korean. And going back to Korea, where my parents lived through the Korean War, what was fascinating with that experience is that as a military intelligence officer, I had access to classified information, briefing my commander daily on what the North Koreans had done within the last 24 hours. And here I was having access to confidential classified information where my relatives and who were still living there in Korea, as well as the fellow Korean citizens, were going about their daily life. And if they had known some of the information I had, 
would they live their lives differently? To me, it was also an experience in which I had a information asymmetry. I had access to information that they didn't, and it made me more responsible and take what I was doing each and every day seriously with purpose. Because my time there is a short tour of duty. It's only one year, and we have to make every day count. And so for me, it was having that purpose to do the work in a quality way to help make the relationship between the U.S. forces and Korean forces stronger, to put in operational plans that made the forces a lot more prepared and ready for uh, and updated to the time that I was there, uh, and to leave the place at a at much better, you know, much uh, more. Safer. Um, safer and prepared than when I arrived. That was my duty and my obligation and my responsibility. And I held that with me, right? People think like, oh, you had so much fun. You had relatives there. True. But my first purpose was actually to do the work while there. And I bring that back to what I'm doing here today. The parallel to it is that I had a unique insight through my own personal experience with my daughter needing to go through a liver transplant and seeing what was status quo in the information asymmetry I had or was presented with when trying to find out more information whether the first doctor was the right surgeon for my daughter. He didn't know that I had 10 years of experience in healthcare, right? But the everyday patient doesn't have access to information and be empowered. And that's what I carry on today is this responsibility to help change or transform healthcare based on the information or the insights that I do have. From what you have done previously in your military career, when you came out into the corporate world and you look at the healthcare industry, it's a highly regulated, right. and there is high information asymmetry, right. and you wanted to be able to help people better in getting the information organized through Delta. In right. Way. It's an interesting pattern, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, in your opinion, what are the most important traits for a leader? I think that there are five. Mm. First is to have a clear vision. Mm. I think a leader without that is like a chicken with its head cut off. Right. People have to know where are we, what are we doing, what's the purpose behind what we do. Secondly is the ability to communicate because that is a skill set in which we can bring the people together to rally toward the vision and the mission. And I think thirdly it's to be authentic, to be genuine in as a role model and to ask of others what I would do as a leader myself. Fourthly is motivate a team. Right? Not having the ability to do that, I think, is a huge detriment. And lastly is, I think for a leader, it's very important to learn and adapt. Admit mistakes, because you don't have perfect information from day zero, but to be able to be learning and adapting and sharing that authentically to the rest of the team and fully rally toward the vision. So do you think that a team gets better through a crisis or through peacetime, as in peacetime from the viewpoint of they're just basically taking the formula and just put money and effort onto it. I mean, companies can be thought of in terms of wartime and peacetime by bad sure. companies. Okay, so if I heard your question correctly, Bernie, it's do people learn more from yeah, crisis? crisis? It is, it's a very fasc, it's a fascinating question. I think uh, going back to what I mentioned about Warren Bennis, the crucible experience, yeah, sure. I think through crisis, the stress that's put into the situation, the true colors of each person comes out. And unfortunately, some people, they wither away, they falter from the gravity of it. And others actually toughen up and they emerge stronger for it. I think that and so I think it's the leader's job to ensure that they have the right team in place with the right values and to be able to know, is this person here for just a job or truly owning it, 
owning the problem and owning and finding a solution with the team together. And I think the chances are that person through the crisis would be able to emerge stronger is increased. There's always a discussion on managers and leaders. Do you see a difference between them, between a manager and a leader? Yes, I do. I do, definitely. Because I think a manager is, uh, maybe using your analogy, they are good at peace time situations you know they have very clear black and white guidelines they know exactly what to do what their job scope is and what is success it's very clearly written out I think for a leader they operate in environments in which there is no clear answer there's a lot of ambiguity volatility they have to be clear about what is the vision or the intent Uh, in the military call it the commander's intent right? And to be able to navigate and bring the people together, influence and others to be motivated and come to the the finish line together. That's the difference. Interesting. So now I'm going to ask you sort of the final question, but I think it's always what I always wanted to know. Can you talk about your style of leadership and how did it come about? Sure. I would call it servant leadership. And This was developed from West Point. I think at West Point, uh, at a very young age, we're taught the theories of leadership. And at 21, 22 years old, we're given a tremendous amount of responsibility being a platoon leader. And that's what I did. And my experience, as I mentioned previously. And I think that when you're in the situations where you sink or swim, you're leading people's lives, and not just the soldier, but the soldier's family's lives, because it's all in together. You don't see this in corporate, but if the domestic life of a soldier is not healthy, then that soldier will not be 100% fully present doing the job, right? And so I was given a tremendous amount of responsibility at a very young age. And in a situation in which I was the first female leader, most of these soldiers were twice my age, with master's degrees or PhDs and uh, because they ran counterintelligence. I was in the military intelligence support and so I was put to the test. And to be able to emerge from that as a leader who can be trusted, a leader who was a role model to them, I learned at a very young age on how to connect with each and every soldier, to understand what made them tick, to be able to connect with them so then what they achieved, what I needed them to achieve. So then as a platoon, we were, as a team, achieving our total mission. And so from that experience as a platoon leader, my style and how I interact with others has not changed over the years, whether it was in the military or corporate or here today as an entrepreneur. Grace, many thanks for coming on the podcast. And I really enjoyed this conversation on leadership. And in closing, I have two questions. Sorry, I have to make you recommend again. Can you recommend a okay. no movie, podcast, or anything that has recently made an impact in your personal work life? Two things. I'm in the middle, actually, so I didn't finish the book, but I'm mm. in the middle of reading Dr. Eric Topol's Deep Medicine. Mm. He's a doctor who summarizes how AI can make healthcare human again. So he does a a brilliant job of putting together the entire landscape of how AI is impacting healthcare, but how that would actually enable doctors to be more human to the patient. And I agree with that wholeheartedly just because at DocDoc, it's just not our AI technology platform, but it's marrying that up with our call center of doctors to help guide patients through it. And it's always refreshing whenever a doctor shares his or her story about the real world in medicine. Nothing sugar-coated, fully open-minded. And I think the other thing I wanted to share is I, uh, there's a couple of articles that have come out from investigative journalists. One was from Tampa Bay Times called Heartbroken, and the other one just came out recently from the New York Times. The title of the article being doctors were alarmed when I have my children have surgery here. And it's a shock and awe piece in which 
patients, children actually, who were patients needed heart surgeries and went to institutions in which the medical center was not equipped or ready to do a quality job. And unfortunately, the patient died. And um, I'm saddened because as a mother of a child who would have, may have had been in a situation in which I didn't have that information, you know, I could have been in the same situation as many of these families. And also for the doctors, right, to be in a situation where uh, there's a media piece coming out to vilify them in such a way to spur discussion or transparency. I believe there's a better way of actually allowing transparency in the entire health ecosystem in which all players who do good quality work can rise together. So how do my audience find you? I can be found on Facebook, Grace Park, or on LinkedIn, Grace Park Search Act. Mm. And you can definitely Google me at Bernard Leung. This podcast is co-produced by Caroline and myself. You can find us on now every platform, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, Luminary, Himalaya, and Spotify. You can definitely tweet to me your feedback as well. And of course, most importantly, just tell me who you might want to be on the show. And you can join the Telegram group too. So once again, Grace, many thanks for coming on the show. And I look forward to speak to you again. Thanks, Bernie. Thank you.